So good evening, everyone. Uh, we're just waiting a couple minutes to all the participants uh, are here. And then once we get a signal from Kevin, uh, we will start uh, this evening's meeting. Okay, so signal has been given, uh, and so we will open the meeting. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. John Allison. I am the past president of the Nipissing District Branch of the Canadian International Council. I'm also a full professor at Nipissing University in North Bay, Canada. We would like to welcome you to this evening's speaker evening. Uh, this evening, uh, Nipissing, uh, CIC Nipissing, uh, in conjunction with uh, CIC Edmonton, under the presidency of Kevin McLeod, uh, we are quite pleased uh, to bring you John Foster. We are very much looking forward to this evening's presentation. So now it gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, John is an uh, international oil economist with a lifetime of experience. He worked in the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the British Petroleum Group, and Petro-Canada, based in London, England, Washington, D.C., and Ottawa, Canada. His recent book is Oil and World Politics, the real story of today's conflict zones. In the past decade, he has published numerous articles and given many talks across Canada, including with the Canadian International Council. They are listed on his website, johnfosterwrites.com. He grew up in London, England, graduating in economics and law from Cambridge University. This evening, John will address the role of petroleum in the ongoing tensions and rivalries between the United States, Russia, and China. Since his talk to CIC branches two years ago, U.S. relations with China and, uh, with China and Russia have nosedived. After being the world's hegemon for 30 years, the U.S. aims now to contain the rise of Russia and China. Petroleum politics are part of the story. For example, Nord Stream 5 or Nord Stream 2 uh, in Germany. Facing a hostile America, China and Russia have formed a strategic partnership with both countries investing heavily in pipelines. Since 9-11, Western countries have launched military interventions and imposed sanctions on one petroleum country after another. None of these interventions has been successful. Why does Canada support these actions? John explores these issues and more. Please give a warm welcome to John Foster as he addresses the topic of pipeline politics around the world. Over to you, John. Okay, fine. Uh, so uh, John, I want to thank you for your kind words and uh, give thanks also to, to Kevin behind the scenes uh, and uh, express my appreciation to, uh, to Edmonton uh, and uh, Nipissing Branches uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to be with you again. And uh, as uh, John was saying, I, I want to focus this evening uh, on the global powers, as to say the uh, United States and Russia and China and the pipeline politics. So um, you may say, well, why pipeline politics? Uh, they're part of the story and they illustrate the geopolitical realities, uh, the, the concrete in, in very concrete terms, the physical. Uh, and another thing is that uh, pipelines are geographic. They uh, connect countries together in Canada, of course they connect provinces together in Canada to the US. And to keep track of the geography, uh, I'll be sharing lots of maps and pictures too in, in PowerPoint, and if you give me for that. Uh, I'll talk for thir about 30 minutes, you can, you can time it, it might be 31. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to the interesting bit, which is uh, Q&A and, and comments. So uh, just a minute with your, or a moment with your patience while I successfully load and share the screen of, the, of my slides. Uh, good. Uh, just to just to check uh, with John, you can see all right the uh, the, the title slide. Yes. 
perfect. Okay, fine. Then then we're kind of uh, uh, home, to, home to the races. Um, but yeah, I would like to, to start in kind of the generality to say that uh, petroleum is a dilemma. They may feel that in, in Edmonton at times. Uh, it's a major cause of climate change. Uh, and yet it's fundamental to the world's economy, even as some countries want to reduce its use. And petroleum is part of the geopolitical rivalry, as I'll go on to show. It, it, uh, and as John was saying, in, in, in the past two or more years, US relations with, with Russia and China have taken a nosedive, just as climate change has accelerated. And this confrontation, in my view, detracts from dealing with the, uh, the climate crisis. Now, the, the United States is no longer the sole superpower, the, the hegemon. Uh, Russia has strengthened, China is rising fast, and the world is becoming uh, multipolar. It's an uncomfortable time of change. And Washington wants to contain Russia and China to limit their influence. And it sees them as adversaries. Canada and other US allies are, are going along. But that's not a recipe for collaboration on anything. So I'd like to start with the United States. Washington has literally hundreds of people monitoring world oil and gas at the departments of state, energy, and more. They used to come across my desk when I was at the World Bank, and I never quite knew why. And no other government has this scale of coverage, and for sure not Canada, probably not more than a handful. And the US and Europe have major petroleum companies with deep influence around the world, and governments work closely with oil companies, again, as I, as I, have, as I personally know. And since 9-11, we've seen conflicts involving petroleum one after another. Western wars have destroyed Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria. Western sanctions have hurt Iran, Syria, Venezuela, Belarus. It's not a picture. It's not a pretty picture. Now, uh, sanctions, this is the, 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 the modern way to go, it seems, are invisible to us. They're easy to sell politically. But they're another form of war, of warfare. Uh, they're unilateral. They are not endorsed by the United Nations. And all these conflicts have been allegedly for democracy and human rights, that's how they're sold. And yet Afghans, Iraqis and others have suffered drones, night raids and worse. Thousands have died, millions have become refugees. To be frank, the wars were about power and petroleum and all of them sought regime change. All brought misery and not one a success story. Conflicts have pushed all the countries I've listed and named towards China and Russia for protection or partnership, a kind of a, <laughs> an unexpected outcome. Uh, and the latest obviously is Afghanistan. Now, the US game is to preserve the uh, rules-based international order with the US as the unipolar leader. And this phrase, rules-based international order is a constant refrain. China and Russia reject what they call rules of the few, depends how you look at it. And they insist on universally accepted laws based on the UN Charter. Turning now to uh, more, more, more to the hydrocarbons, with fracking, the United States has become the world's largest producer of oil and gas and has become a major exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas. And it wants to muscle in on Europe's huge gas market, displacing Russian gas. And Washington calls it freedom gas. It's kind of a brand name. I'll come back to the US time and again as I talk about Russia and China. Turning to Russia. Russia is a petro state. It's the world's single largest exporter of natural gas. It's the second largest oil exporter just behind Saudi Arabia. And pipelines and sea routes to market are vital to its economy. It wants to sell oil and gas in Asia and Europe, even the United States, and they want to buy it. 
Washington has never liked the idea of Russia integrated into Europe. It sees this as a threat to US leadership, but it's always opposed Russian gas to Europe. It cites energy security, but it's always an interesting exercise. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Now, from a Russian point of view, NATO is provocative and threatening. NATO has troops, ships, planes along Russia's borders. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, NATO expanded membership to Eastern Europe. In my view, NATO is a tool of US hegemony, and it's a way to keep Europe on side against Russia. Now, the West accuses Russia of aggression for annexing Crimea, for breaking Donbass away from Eastern U Ukraine, and it imposed sanctions. Russia has a different viewpoint. It, there are always two narratives going on. It alleges a Western-inspired coup in Ukraine. It's a complex story, and uh, I documented in my book, Oil and World Politics. Western sanctions exclude Russian gas. Uh, Europe began importing it in the 1960s, and the binding of East and West by pipeline helped build trust. And today, the European Union imports about 40% of its gas from Russia. Russia wants to sell its gas, Europe wants to buy it. You know, it takes two to tango. And in the Soviet era, its gas pipelines to Europe passed mostly through Ukraine. But more recently, I hate to say it, um, Ukraine's payments problems, corruption, and outright hostility have threatened Russia's gas exports from Russia's point of view. And Russia, forgive me, Ukraine, stopped uh, buying Russian gas directly for its internal, its domestic market. And instead, it buys Russian gas indirectly from Poland and Romania and Slovakia. They call it reverse gas, but it's still Russian gas. Ukraine has a long-term deal for, for Russian transit gas. That's the stuff that passes through uh, Ukraine to Europe until 2024, which it once extended. Ukraine earns big transit fees, uh, 2 billion US dollars per year. This would be with a billion uh, or more. And it desperately wants to keep them. Glad we don't have that in the, between the provinces. And Poland became a transit route in 1997. The Yamel pipeline brings Russian gas fire Poland to Germany. Poland too is uh, hostile. And last year, it ended its long-term deal with Russia for transit gas. Now it auctions pipeline space in short-term deals. And next year, Poland will stop using Russian gas domestically. It plans to import gas in, like LNG from the United States and gas by pipe from Norway. Belarus is part of the pipeline pro, uh, politics. And shown in red is, is the, the details don't matter too much, it's kind of schematic, is the Yemel gas pipeline, which I just mentioned. And shown in green is Russia's huge oil pipeline to Europe. Belarus is a buffer state adjacent to Russia, and the West seeks to prise it away from Russia. But Western sanctions have pushed it closer. And for Russia, the routes through Poland and Ukraine are unreliable, they're problematic. So 10 years ago, it, it built, it opened uh, Nord Stream 1 with European partners, you can see it on the map, uh, directly to Germany under the Baltic Sea. And it's just completed Nord Stream 2. And once certified, that's what's going on right now, uh, Nord Stream 2 will make Germany Europe's main entry point for Russian gas. Now, Nord Stream 2, in my uh, thinking, makes commercial sense. The route to market is much shorter than via Ukraine. There are no transit fees, but it is controversial. Germany and Central Europe want it. Germany sees gas as a transition fuel to a green future after phasing out nuclear and coal. Ukraine and Poland oppose Nord Stream 2 vociferously, 
and the United States tried all out to kill it. Nord Stream 1 and 2 are both uh, Russian European projects, and not just Russian, they're, they're joint ventures. And Nord Stream 1 is owned 51% by Russia's Gazprom, 49% by major, major European energy companies. And Nord Stream 2 also began as a joint venture, 51% Gazprom, 49% European, some the same as the other uh, Nord Stream 1, some a bit different, including Shell, uh, but it had to be restructured. Poland's competition agency uh, forced these European partners to relinquish their 49% shareholding. And rather than quit the project, they became financial investors instead, they put the money up. So that made Russia's Gazprom the sole owner, 100%, as well as gas supplier, 100%. And the consequences of that concentration, I'll describe it in a minute. Construction began in 2018. The United States passed a law in 2019, threatening sanctions on the Swiss ship laying the pipe. The Swiss pulled out, delaying construction by a year or longer than that. Two Russian vessels finally completed the line despite being sanctioned themselves. And the United States threatened German contractors as well with sanctions. Germany stood firm. In July, German Chancellor Merkel visited Washington and she insisted on Nord Stream 2. And President Biden uh, gave way. Uh, the pipeline was virtually complete, about 98%, and he wanted to mend damaged relations with Germany. They were not in good shape. Uh, the, the EU's most powerful country. So the line now is complete, two strings, uh, two, two parallel pipelines. But the battle uh, that continues is now uh, a legal battle. And the EU says pipeline operators, like Nord Stream 2, uh, cannot own the gas they're transporting. And the idea is to create market competition. That's basic to the EU energy policy. But in 2019, the EU extended its rules uh, to include, which they haven't before, new marine pipelines, like offshore pipelines, importing gas. There was only one, and that was Nord Stream 2. So, and it claimed discrimination, said it was being ganged up on, and uh, it appealed. A German court, uh, Dusseldorf, rejected the appeal, and that means the, the pipeline may, so I read and understand, have to reserve half its capacity for third parties, third party access. But are there any? Gazprom is Russia's only gas exporter by pipeline, that's Russian law. And Nord Stream 2 risks operating half empty. Yesterday, it appealed again, uh, this time to Germany's Supreme Court. So we'll see what happens. But Nord Stream 2 illustrates the geopolitics. Uh, which I would just say they're brutal. Now, switch gears from Nord Stream 2. Last year, uh, Russia opened Turk Stream. This is another pipeline and it bypasses Poland and Ukraine. And two parallel strings bring Russian gas under the Black Sea to Turkey. And the first supplies the Turkish market, which is a big market. And the second connects to Bulgaria and then Serbia and Hungary. The Hungarian section just opened. Bulgaria, Serbia and Hungary have built their own pipelines to receive the Russian gas. There's no in Russian investment in their pipelines. They plan as well to create a competitive market, receiving gas from elsewhere too. And they've made sure, like by that, that they comply with EU energy and uh, competition policies. Now, a rival pipeline, here's the competition, Southern Gas Corridor opened in January. So all these things are pretty new. And it brings gas from, the, from Azerbaijan, the Caspian Sea, through Turkey and Greece to Italy. A connecting line is being built north from Greece to Bulgaria, 
and eventually uh, Romania and Hungary. No surprise, Washington and Brussels strongly back the Southern Gas Corridor, the operator, by the way, is BP. And Washington and Brussels also favor uh, offshore gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, as, uh, Israel and Cyprus. And there's talk of building a pipeline to Greece and Italy. But I would say its feasibility is not yet proven. Construction will be challenging, depths reaching 3,000 meters, that's 10,000 feet or so, and it will go very near Turkey, and Turkey is fiercely opposed. Pipelines are important today in the same way that railway building was important in the 19th century. They connect trading partners and they influence the regional balance of power. That's why they're so vital in understanding the geopolitics. Russian gas is exported by LNG tanker as well. And tankers have flexibility of route and destination, which pipelines lack. Russia has two LNG plants, both new, uh, one at Yamal up in the Arctic there, and one at uh, Sakhalin Island in the Far East. I'll show a map in a second. And it's building uh, two more LNG plants. And the projects have Western partners in one combination or another, uh, Shell, Total, ExxonMobil. From the Russian Arctic, ice-breaking tankers bring LNG west to Europe, crashing through the ice and east to China and Japan. And from the Russian Far East, that's uh, Sakhalin Island, you can just see it perhaps, uh, LNG tankers supply East Asia. Facing a hostile America, uh, Russia and China have formed a strategic partnership. And Russia is China's largest source of natural gas, very recent, and it's China's second largest source of oil, just behind Saudi Arabia, not much in it. A dozen years ago, Russian oil exports all went west to Europe, and now they move east to uh, Asia as well. See the pipeline, mostly by a new pipeline from uh, East Siberia to China. It's 4,200 kilometers long. It's a uh, monstrous length, and China has become Russia's largest oil customer. Russia began the gas exports <coughs> to China two years ago, and it's Power of Siberia, that's the name, pipeline, brings gas from East Siberia to Northeast China. And Russia is planning now a second line from Yamal, which is pretty interesting. So that from Yamal, gas can go west to Europe or east to China. And each of these two lines is 4,000 kilometers long, rivaling Canada's longest. And as you'll know, that's the Trans-Canada gas line from Alberta to Quebec. Uh, doubtless from Edmonton through North Bay. So let's think about China's perspective. Within the next few years, China will overtake the United States as the world's biggest economy. And from some measures, it's already done so. China has raised 800 million of its population out of poverty, and these are extraordinary achievements. China takes an economic non-military approach to trade and investment, and has made huge investments worldwide in every continent. And China's rise is a major turning point for the West and the world. China is creating the infrastructure to, uh, to link it with Europe by land and sea. And that's its Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI. And China now sends freight by rail all the way to Europe a thousand trains every month compares quite well with those through Kingston, I would think. And the journey takes less than half that by sea. The US opposes the BRI, not a surprise. And G7 leaders have announced a rival initiative and we'll see how it goes. To fuel this astonishing economic growth, China imports massive amounts of energy and China has become the world's largest importer of oil, coal, and LNG. Much of the oil comes from the Middle East, though increasingly from Russia and Central Asia. And much of China's coal and LNG used to come from Australia. Last year, 
Australia demanded an investigation into the origin of COVID-19 and Beijing was not amused. It saw this as a Western maneuver to frame China, probably was. China stopped buying coal from Australia as a consequence and its smaller LNG importers stopped buying Australian gas. Australia is a major LNG exporter. Washington sees China's rise as threatening because China is top adversary and Washington's pressuring allies to join against China. In US-China talks this year, high level, uh, the Chinese forcefully pushed back like at Anchorage and uh, so in China. And they accused the US of provocations and interference. And in my thought, they, they, have a, they do have a point. The US Navy conducts so-called freedom of navigation exercises in the South China Sea, and its allies too, even Canada has the occasional ship. And from China's viewpoint, these actions are provocative, threatening its backyard. I mean, can you imagine Chinese warships patrolling the, the Georgia Strait around Vancouver Island? Well, this summer, China warned Western navies to stay away from its coastline and islands or risk the consequences. There's a lot more to say about that, but this is a, 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 quick, a quick introduction. Also provocative are uh, Western accusations of abuse in China's Northwest region, Xinjiang. Now, Xinjiang, which I probably mispronounced was my best effort, uh, is a <coughs> strategic uh, gateway for pipelines from Asia and freight trains to Europe. The West alleges genocide of the Uyghurs, uh, the, the, big, the big minority uh, uh, indigenous folk there, a, a very serious accusation, genocide, and they've imposed sanctions. Uh, no question. Are the claims justified or theater to demonize China? There's a big game going on. And independent researchers find the evidence unconvincing, uh, and so do I. It, it originates from a handful of interlocking kind of think tanks uh, with close ties to Washington. Climate change is the real threat for all nations. And this year, China, Chinese cities experienced uh, torrential floods, Siberia record heat, and Alberta and uh, British Columbia, of course, as well. China is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, but it does have 20% of the world's population, 1.4 billion, and its per capita emissions are a little less than Germany's, half those of Canada and the US. Uh, and to reduce its emissions, Canada is investing heavily in renewable energy, including hydro, obviously, and it's the world's biggest producer of wind and solar energy. But it's also by far the biggest user of, of coal. And it plans to move off coal to re renewable energy and natural gas. It's what it calls this, this twin pillar policy. Washington wants to cooperate with China on climate change. It wants to confront on other issues like Xinjiang and the Taiwan Strait. And China said, I suppose in Chinese, uh, no dice. The, the, the US cannot cherry pick. And the message that they conveyed was loud and clear and forceful. And the pushback was a new experience uh, in Washington. China fears a Western blockade of its sea routes. It's heavily reliant on the Middle East. And to reduce its vulnerability, China has invested in oil and gas pipelines from Siberia, which I've mentioned, uh, others across Myanmar, and others from Central Asia. And these are huge investments that they're long lasting, the geopolitical links for the next 50 years. But the pipelines across Myanmar deliver oil and gas to uh, Northwest China, and they avoid the Strait of Malacca, a strategic sh shipping choke point, one of the world's major ch choke points. It's between Sumatra, which is the island of, one of the islands of Indonesia, and uh, Malaysia. And from Kazakhstan, China has built a 3,000 kilometer oil pipeline to Xinjiang again. 
Kazakhstan has the world's 12th largest reserves of oil. It's a new oil province. And from Central Asia, China has built three parallel pipelines to Xinjiang again. And they deliver gas from Turkmenistan, they pick up more in Uzbekistan as they go along, and Kazakhstan, no war, no sanctions. Turkmenistan has the world's fourth largest reserves of gas after Russia, Iran, and Qatar. And who knows that? From Xinjiang, gas pipelines cross China to Shanghai and Hong Kong. And again, the system is very recent, built in record time, very long. Xinjiang is 4,000 kilometers to uh, Shanghai and 5,000 kilometers to Hong Kong. So that's enough on China. So how to dismiss countries quickly. So let's look for a moment uh, at Afghanistan. So I've told the that tale a bit here before, but I'll, I'll just give a quickie. Uh, the United States has long wanted a pipeline built south from Turkmenistan, and it would transit Afghanistan to pa Pakistan and India, the big markets. And it's called TAPI, initials of the four countries. And I found this story when Canadian troops first went to Kandahar. It's about 2006 or seven, wasn't it? And, and TAPI was long-standing US strategy to link Central with South Asia, as opposed to East Asia or up to Russia. And in the 1990s, when the Taliban ran Afghanistan, they in fact actually visited Texas to discuss the pipeline. And earlier this year, they visited Turkmenistan they pledge support and safety for the project. Now they're in power. Question, will TAPI get built at last? Answer, too early to say. I, haven't, I have no idea. So when a pipeline crosses more than one country, each country becomes a stakeholder and the countries are bonded together, physically, economically, and diplomatically. And that's true for Canada and America is true for Russia and China. And Russia and China are cooperating on pipelines, trains, bridges, like this new railway bridge. It's two, two kilometers long, and it crosses the Amur River between the two countries. You can actually see the two different gauges there, if, you, if you're a railway buff. The Western sanctions on Russia and China haven't worked. Both countries have adapted making and growing things previously imported from the West. I think Russia has now become a, an enormous grain exporter, hadn't been. And all these trade links benefit countries across Eurasia. And the tide is turning against Western hegemony uh, leadership. Confront, confrontation with uh, Russia or China, both nuclear powers, is a dangerous game. Are they real adversaries or imaginary ones? In my view, it's a fearsome waste of money. And it's good for the arms industry and it's bad for taxpayers. And instead of reshaping the economy to fend off climate catastrophe, it's spent fending off non-existent threats. And all those Western interventions in other countries have ended badly. Humanitarian disasters, flow back too, as millions flee as refugees to Europe, Canada, and elsewhere. And millions more will flee in years to come from climate change, climate refugees. So why does Canada support the confrontations, the interventions, the sanctions, no questions asked? Under the UN Charter, no country is entitled to interfere in the internal affairs of another and Canada has signed the charter. Now, of course, <laughs> Canada's oil exports benefit by sanctions on Iran and Venezuela. The less oil on the world market, the higher the price. Elementary economics 101, would it be? And with US sanctions on Venezuela, American refineries have switched from Venezuelan crude to oil sands bitumen to Canada and Alberta's good fortune. Now, it's Alice in Wonderland. It's not Canada's business to tell others how to run their country. We don't tolerate interference in Canada. 
And in my view, we need cooperation and diplomacy, not sanctions and saber rattling. And dare I say it, just laying it on a bit, um, Canada has a herd mentality. It blindly follows the flock. Uh, foreign, uh, foreign policy much comes from groups such as NATO, Five Eyes, G7, and of course, Washington. And we have a Western perspective, but we are not the world. Uh, NATO comprises only 30 of the world's 194 countries. And Canada itself has a multicultural society. It's changed profoundly, certainly since I ever first came here. And it raises a question, are we free therefore to reach out to other countries respecting their differences? We need to stop tilting at windmills, start listening, acting positively. Our foreign policy needs a rethink. So to sum up, the world is becoming multipolar. Russia and China are now closely allied for years to come. US NATO interventions have all failed, and they've pushed other countries to partner with Russia and China. Climate change is the real enemy, not, in my view, Russia, not China. They're just handy, handy bait noir. With all these new links by pipeline, train, and sea, Europe is becoming a peninsula of Eurasia. Those interconnections are here to stay. And question, my final question, where does that leave North America? So that's my big picture. It builds on my book and the article since then. And you can find them at my website. Uh, at this point, I look forward to your questions and your comments with, I suppose, some trepidation. And uh, uh, thanks very much. I'll, I'll just get out of the stop sharing. Thank you for your very interesting and uh, very erudite presentation, John. Um, what I will do now is uh, consult with the Q&A function. <clears throat> so if I could ask uh, members of the audience to put your questions into the Q&A box, and then I will uh, read them uh, to John. Uh, so our first question then um, comes from uh, Manfred Benefeld, uh, and it, it reads as follows. Since pipelines are enormously costly and are amateurized over long periods, how are we to understand the massive recent pipeline developments that you have described? Do they imply that demands that, quote, the remaining oil should be left in the ground so far as is possible, close quote, are likely to remain empty promises? A uh, very interesting question from Man from Manfred, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, see see how I can address that 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 thought. Uh, most of the projects I've been describing, uh, at least these particular pipeline projects uh, uh, for, for natural gas, uh, there, there were there were one or two uh, for for oil. The one the the one through Russia, of course, uh, through through uh, uh, Belarus and and uh, Poland into, uh, into Germany has been in existence of an awful long time, since the 1960s or so. Um, uh, and I assume it's fully, uh, fully amortized and, and hopefully sections get replaced as, as, as need be. Um, so most of the, uh, the, the, the line I can think of from Turkmenistan to China, uh, I, I would put a lot of very expensive oil in the, in the production field in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in in Kazakhstan uh, is oil, which I would say is a diversification from China's point of view uh, to oil that might come from elsewhere, and it comes over land. So for, it's a, a, in some ways a strategic investment, and again pipelines link countries together, so Kazakhstan and China, so east-west connection in the Eurasian uh, region, spirit of, of the, the, the big, big thing going on there of regional cooperation. Think of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, most of the pipelines I described, uh, particularly, of course, in the in the European Russian uh, part of the part of my talk, uh, were for natural gas, and uh, for Germany for Germany for one uh, sees uh, officially sees natural gas as a transition fuel uh, to uh, uh, to a green future. And uh, 
uh, on the lines that it, it uh, uh, of course, as, as a fossil fuel, it, it, it creates CO2 emissions, but only half the amount that, that, that a, a, heavier, a heavy crew would do, or, or in particular coal would do. Um, and uh, uh, indeed, I would think that they have, in some ways, got, got themselves in a, in a bit of a pickle uh, this year, right now, with, with the, you know, the gas price increase. Which is a, an, another story, which I can go into in Q and A if you like. Um, uh, I would have thought there's, there's plenty of time to 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 write these off over a 20, 25 year period uh, from from a Russian from a Russian point of view. Um, but I, I'm not privy further. I'm not privy to any numbers. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that response. Um, our next question comes from Furquan uh, Gail. How does the recent American withdrawal from Afghanistan fit into the pipeline politics? Um, thank you, thank you, Furquan, for, for that question. Uh, I suppose it, what it does do, uh, one thing it, uh, it, it does is this, it, it, uh, What's going, to, what's going to be Afghanistan's future? And uh, the, the way it's looking right now is that uh, four countries in particular have been making overtures to, to, to uh, the Taliban-led Afghanistan. That's uh, Russia, China, uh, Iran, and Pakistan, particularly Pakistan. Uh, 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 and offering uh, cooperation uh, it provided the uh, Taliban, I would say, behave, behave from their point of view in a, in a reasonable fashion. And I, I think the Taliban are giving, giving the right signals. Uh, it's a question of uh, what, what's going to happen there. Uh, to an extent that, uh, as I read the, the last day or two, uh, this is causing quite some concern in, in uh, Washington and London, uh, right? They're now uh, um, uh, at high level visits from Britain to, to Kabul uh, to, to talk to them about we don't know what. I suspect to try and, sh after, after all the, the, uh, the negative noises and the freezing of funds, uh, to, to start to, to make overtures to the, to the Taliban, uh, partly to uh, ward off uh, uh, their being assimilated into, uh, into Eurasia in the way I was describing with these other four countries. What I see going on is a continuation of the 19th century great game uh, between, between Russia and at that time, British India. Um, uh, how this will work out in terms of the pipeline politics remains to be seen. I think I, 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 I fobbed that one off a bit. Uh, but but uh, to make that line happen, uh, financially, uh, right now, with uh, World, uh, IMF and World Bank funds to uh, Afghanistan suspended, uh, it looks to China to put the money up if they, if they wish to. Of course, from a Chinese point of view, uh, that, that the gas would be going in a direction which is not to China, it would be going south. So how, I don't know how they would feel about that. On the other hand, they might feel very happy to do something which uh, is, uh, is friendly to Pakistan. Uh, in, in the spirit of the, of the uh, economic development corridor they have as a, as a joint agreement. Um, it's fluid, that's enough. Okay, um, shall we go on with the next question then? All right, so um, Kathan Gand, uh, his question is as follows. Uh, does Canada's engagements in Afghanistan and the Middle East reek of hypocrisy? Uh, on one end, we seek to showcase the country as a humanitarian messiah for displaced populations. On the other, we condone the violence that Washington, perpe Washington perpetuates under the name of freedom and democracy. After all, the gas line from Alberta has also inversely affected and has, str has strongly been opposed by Indigenous communities affected by it. Uh, I, I would uh, find that uh, a, a good statement, uh, a good comment, uh, and I, I have nothing really to add to it. Okay. All right. 
Thank you, Kefan. Um, okay, so uh, we will move then to uh, Charlotte Dennett's uh, question. Uh, Charlotte uh, asks, can you comment on the need to protect pipelines at all costs? That was uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Certainly. Uh, can you comment on the need to protect pipelines at all costs? That was my father's mission in 1945 as America's first master spy in the Middle East to protect the Trans-Arabian Pipeline sending oil to Lebanon. And she says, see my book, The Crash of Flight 3804, A Lost Spy, A Daughter's Quest, and the Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. Um, uh, good evening to Charlotte. I, I would say that I have uh, to tell people I've read the book. Uh, it's, uh, it's a gripping tale. It's extremely well done. And it, it gives a, a feeling for, for Washington, uh, for, for the intrigues and shenanigans of, of, uh, of the Middle East and for pipeline routes there. That was the, that was the tap line pipeline. I didn't talk about that. Uh, but from Saudi Arabia, it was a line to bring uh, uh, oil in uh, just after World War II. Uh, to the to by pipeline to the eastern Mediterranean where, where tankers could pick it up. And the question was the route. And that's what Charlotte describes in her book. Should it go out through uh, Syria, which was then at that time French controlled, or out through uh, uh, Palestine at that time before the creation of, is of Israel? And her father uh, was involved in the uh, US uh, side, uh, get, get, I say the US game, and he, he died in a, a, a strange. A uh, 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 plane crash in in Ethiopia. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so that said, uh, do you protect uh, pipelines at any price? Uh, clearly, the, the Taliban said so they they will protect the pipeline. But uh, before that, the um, you know, so pipelines get protected. So the the huge pipelines that go from uh, Azerbaijan to to Turkey for oil and for gas uh, uh, are protected. Uh, so that's how it is. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that, John. Um, and now let's see, uh, we have um, a comment from Margaret Huber. Uh, great talk once again, John. It was very helpful use of explanatory slides for non-specialists like me. When is your next book coming out? <laughs> uh, well, to Margaret, hello, good evening, and thank you for that thought. Um, I think I, I'm much happier to, 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 I think, to continue now by way of articles which, which build on the, the, the previous book and to uh, uh, and in the form of webinars of this, of this kind and talks. Uh, that, that keeps me pretty busy. The problem with the book is, is keeping up to date. It's a, it's a big sweat. Uh, and uh, what once it's done, it's frozen, and and, and life continues. Uh, I I think I, I've tried to keep the book rewritten and rewritten and rewritten uh, without showing it to anybody. Uh, but what I've done with the results is publish them in articles in my in my website. So, so that's that. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, I think that's, that's enough to say. Okay. Uh... Thank you on that, John. Certainly, I can uh, uh, echo your comments with regard to writing a book and, and seeing it almost instantaneously being frozen. And so uh, I very much uh, am receptive to that as well. <laughs> um, OK, so we now have a guest attendee. Uh, please mention and comment about oil from Saudi Arabia in all of the discussion. Well, that's a that's a, a question as broad as it's long, isn't it? Uh, uh, I could talk about Saudi Arabia from the point of view of uh, the world swing oil producer, as it, it used to be called. In other words, when the, when there, was, there seemed to be need for uh, for, for price stability, uh, more oil was needed on the market. The the Saudis would turn the turn the valves, and more oil would produce, and they would cut it back. And you see this exercise going on in in in, uh, in OPEC. Or now OPEC plus, which includes Russia. Um, so that's uh, that, that's one thing to say. Uh, and from their point of view, they, they, uh, for the kind of 
spending that, that Saudi Arabia indulges in with in its public finances, uh, it needs this kind of oil price right now, as I understand it, the, sort of the, seven, the $70 plus US uh, per barrel. Um, but the, the, uh, a more specific uh, point which interests me, and perhaps in the Canadian context, is I, a lot of people say, uh, Saudi, Canada should not be importing Saudi oil. How about that thought? Uh, into Eastern Canada, it should be uh, Western Alberta oil, which we should get there. Um, um, what I would say to that is that uh, in the east, Eastern uh, Canadian refineries, uh, east of, or, no, was, if we take Montreal and uh, Quebec City and then to the east of that, the, the oil they're taking uh, is, is to a certain extent, in, in, Quebec, in, in Quebec is, is Alberta oil, and also to some extent, uh, back on oil, the, the light stuff cracked from, from North Dakota. Uh, but when you take the, uh, the, the big refinery, which is St. John, uh, which uh, does import oil from Saudi Arabia, uh, if, uh, if you look at the statistics, that's the only place the Saudi oil in Canada that it goes, uh, it, it uh, gets an awful lot of its oil, as does the refinery in, in, in uh, Newfoundland, from uh, uh, from the United States, fracked fracked light oil from uh, from from Bakken, which is the in North Dakota, um, and the half the products well, after they've been refined get shipped back into the United States. So this is uh, something I think that people don't think of in in, in Canada is that these these two or three refineries uh, in the in the Maritimes in the Atlantic provinces are uh, in fact uh, from a U.S. point of view they're uh, offshore export refineries. Very interesting. We have an additional question from uh, Manfred Benefeld. Uh, thank you for a marvelous presentation. Is it reasonable to think that the fact that green energy production is likely to be far more decentralized would make its arrival desirable by making it less useful for countries seeking to coerce others in one form or another? Or is this just another reason why the progress of the transition to green energy, green energy is likely to be slower than we had hoped? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a humdinger from, from, from Manfred Bienefeld, I must say. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and the answer is, I don't know. I, I would have thought that uh, decentralized energy is a, is a, lot, is a lot safer uh, strategically than, than centralized. And so, uh, if in, in a in a quick nutshell, uh, that's what I would I, I would agree with him. Okay. Um, regrettably, we are unable to take further questions. Uh, my understanding is we are up against uh, another presentation coming from CIC Vancouver. So I want to thank you to all those people um, uh, who have posted questions, and we were un unable, unfortunately, to uh, um, address those questions. And thank you again uh, to our speaker, John Foster, on a, a very interesting and extraordinary presentation. Uh, with that, I encourage uh, everyone to continue to watch uh, for other CIC presentations uh, on the uh, CIC National Office website and the uh, websites of CIC Nipissing and all uh, CIC Edmonton and all the other branches. So thank you again uh, for your participation and coming out uh, to the speaker evening uh, this evening. And uh, thank you uh, once again to our speaker, John Foster. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any other comments uh, from anyone else? Uh, Marianne Higgs thinks, thank you to all the panelists. Okay, so we will end there. Um, have a good evening uh, to all. And I guess we'll leave.